Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick vision of Macbeth Act 5, Scene 5. Just as we saw in Act 5, Scene 4, Macbeth's excessive confidence is evident. Um, here it's evident in the personification of his castle as laughing at and scorning a siege. What we've got is an inversion of the natural order, uh, because a siege is generally designed in order to starve out the occupants of a castle. And yet here, Macbeth's claiming that the besiegers will starve rather than the occupants of the castle. This inversion of the natural order is madness, but it's something that we've seen right from early on in the play in terms of the disturbance of the great chain of being. Macbeth has disturbed the natural order and inverted that natural order by killing a king. Having been interrupted by the cries of women, Macbeth says, I've almost forgot the taste of fears. Essentially, he's become desensitised to both fear and horror because of his exposure to them, and because the witches have given him information that's led to him rejecting fear. He's felt invulnerable. He states that it used to be the case that uh, when he heard something terrible, my fellow of hair would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. And this is something we know to be the case, because in Act 1, Scene 3, when contemplating the murder of Duncan, he referenced the fact that the horrid image doth unfix my hair. In other words, make his hair stand on end. But this has now gone. Macbeth has changed enormously. Um, he's gone from someone who could be disturbed and terrified by the very idea of committing murder to someone who isn't really moved at all by hearing screams. It's worth noting that those screams presumably stem from those who have witnessed the death of Lady Macbeth, and therefore Shakespeare's chosen for that death to take place off stage, maintaining that dramatic focus on Macbeth and his tragic downfall, uh, rather than affording a focus on Lady Macbeth, who's really inconsequential by this point in the play. It's possible to read Macbeth's response to the news of his wife's death in a couple of different ways, and therefore it can be represented dramatically very differently. When he says she should have died hereafter, it's very ambiguous. It could mean that she should have died later, for example, when she was old, or after the battle, when there would have been an opportunity to mourn. And if you take that reading, it presents Macbeth as quite compassionate. We maybe feel a degree of pity for Macbeth as he approaches his uh, tragic fall. But also, it could mean that she would have died at some point. She should have died hereafter. And that would be quite dispassionate, that Macbeth is unfeeling, that he's fatalistic, that this is just something that's going to happen. And similarly, there would have been a time for such a word, there would be an appropriate time for a word such as dead, whether that's after the battle or when she's much older, etc. Again, depending on the reading. The lines tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day seems incredibly laboured and ponderous. And that's as a result of the effect of a variety of different devices. You've got the polysyndet on there that creates a sense of endlessness. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. You've got the alliteration of day to day. You've got the plosives, petty, pace, creeps. And also the additional beat within the line tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. It goes on longer than iambic pentameter normally would. So all of this contributes to this sense of something being slow and laboured. Uh, the personification of time's passage as well through the verb creeps complements that sense of a slow movement. In other words, life is passing slowly. There is a mundanity to life. The lines that follow, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death, suggest that Macbeth feels that despite the slow and lengthy passage of time, this has done nothing to illuminate our lives, nothing to give us any kind of insights, but merely shown the way to death. And that pessimism indicates the pathos of Macbeth. Death doesn't provide a release from the monotony of life, but it's merely a return to dust. Uh, the alliteration of harsh d sounds complements the finality and serves to generate a really depressing tone. And it's no wonder that it's so depressing, because remember, Macbeth has damned himself through committing regicide. He's condemned to eternal torment. Death isn't going to be a release, it's going to be a punishment. The candle metaphor could represent life itself or Lady Macbeth. 
And one of the ways in which it could represent Lady Macbeth is that uh, we have this kind of cremomorphic reference to his wife that we recognise because Lady Macbeth has been associated with a, a candle before. In Act 5, Scene 1, she has a light by her continually. And we also have that repetition of out, out, creating an allusion to Lady Macbeth's out damned spot, out, I say, from that same scene. The basic idea is that, like a candle, time's short. Life is short. Lady Macbeth's life was short, but life in general is also brief in contrast to the eternity of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, we have this sense that there's a tragic significance because Macbeth's damned himself for eternity by the acts he's committed, but he now recognised that not only is his life empty and eternal damnation is on the horizon, but life is short. The brief moment that he has to enjoy the fruits of what he's earned is so limited. This theme of the brevity and pointlessness of life is extended in the following metaphor of a poor actor. Um, a walking shadow could be a reference to an actor itself, as in Puck's concluding speech in A Midsummer Night's Dream, where he states, if we shadows have offended, or it could just be a metaphor for something insubstantial. But the reference to the poor player or bad actor conveys the idea of a life being briefly full of bluster, but then being over and the individual being forgotten by history. And this is obviously something that's plaguing the mind of Macbeth, that he has this you know, powerful position, um, a significant role potentially, but it's so brief and so meaningless in the scope of history. The figurative language use then moves on to life as a play or a speech rather than the actor that's delivering it. The tale is meaningless, despite its bluster, as is life. A tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. In other words, lots of noise, lots of bluster, but signifying nothing, being empty, being meaningless. Having been told that Burnham Wood is advancing towards Dunsinane, Macbeth says, I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Now, pull here may be an incorrect transcription, with Paul perhaps being more appropriate, as in, you know, I pull in resolution, I'm losing my resolution, I'm paling, I'm being shrouded. Um, but similarly, pull works in terms of, you know, pulling back from resolution, losing faith. So either interpretation is fine in terms of conveying the idea that Macbeth is losing his resolve and overconfidence as he recognises that he's been manipulated by the supernatural, that the witches have equivocated with language, that they've manipulated it and him through what they've told him. And this is kind of the resolution of lots of equivocation that we've had throughout the play. Perhaps writ most large when the porter explored this notion in Act 2, Scene 3. But the idea was articulated way back in Act 1, Scene 3, by Banquo, when he said, And oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. We need to remember that Macbeth began this scene with profound confidence. He was going to survive a siege and starve out the enemy. But now, when he states, arm, arm and out, there is no flying hence nor tarrying here, He's casting aside that sensible course of action and deciding to ride out of the castle. Um, exactly what the Scottish lords who are, and the English lords who are facing him said that he couldn't possibly do because that would be madness. Macbeth's rushing towards his fate and the confidence has been lost as he recognises the equivocation of the witches. And the scene ends quite nihilistically with this imagery of giving in to fate Macbeth states, I begin to be aweary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. So he's sick of the light, he's sick of life, he wishes for the world to be torn apart. And we can hear some of this fatalism um, through the use of such profound rhyming couplets. I begin to be aweary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack, at least we'll die with harness on our back. So you've got a double rhyming, rhyming couplet to end this scene, really reinforcing this sense of finality. Um, it's not just the end of the scene, it's really the end of Macbeth. Okay, ta.